Chapter 7 of the Virtue of Hope and How the Virgin Our Lady Practiced It. The virtue of hope naturally follows upon that of faith, since it is ordained as its complement. For if the Most High instills in us the divine light of faith, and if he wishes us, without regard to differences of position and of age, to come into the infallible knowledge of the Godhead and of his mysteries and promises, it is for no other reason than that each one of us, knowing him as our last end and object, and learning of the means of arriving at it, may engender within himself the vehement desire to reach that goal. This desire, which naturally carries with it the inclination to attain this highest good, is called hope, and is infused into our will or natural appetite in baptism. For it belongs to the proper activity of the will to strive after eternal felicity as its greatest good and blessing, to make use of divine grace for obtaining it, and for overcoming the difficulties which will occur in its pursuit. How excellent the virtue of hope is may be learned from the fact that its ultimate object is God himself, our highest good. Although it perceives and seeks him as something that is absent, yet at the same time, it seeks him also as something that is attainable through the merits of Christ and through the proper activity of the one that hopes for it. The acts and operations of this virtue are regulated by the light of divine faith and by the prudent reliance on the infallible promise of the Lord. Thus hope, by means of the reasoning powers, maintains the middle road between despair and presumption not permitting man to presume on his own powers for the attainment of eternal glory, or to set aside meritorious activity on his own part, nor allowing fear or despondency to hinder him from exerting himself toward it on account of the Lord's promises and assurances of final success. In this security, guaranteed by divine faith in all that pertains to these things and applied in prudent and sound reasoning, man hopes without fear of being deceived and yet also without presumption. From this it can be seen that despair may arise both from a want of believing what faith promises and also from a failure to apply to one's own self the security of the divine promises in which one believes, but which one falsely supposes unattainable in one's own regard. Between these two dangerous extremes, hope directs us in the safe way, maintaining us in the confident belief, on the one hand, that God will not deny to ourselves what he has promised to all, and on the other hand, that the promise was not made unconditionally and absolutely, but requires our exertion and effort to merit its fulfillment as far as it is possible with the help of divine grace. For if God has made man capable of the vision of eternal glory, it is not just that any one should attain to such felicity by sinful abuse of the very faculties with which he is to enjoy it, but that he use them in such a way as to befit the end for which he received them. This proper use of the faculties consists in the exercise of the virtues, which prepare man for the enjoyment of his highest good, and in seeking it already in this life by the knowledge and love of God. Now, in Most Holy Mary, this virtue of hope reached the highest degree possible, both in regard to itself and in regard to all its effects, circumstances, and qualities. For the desire and the striving after the last end, which is the vision and the fruition of God, was in her 
more active than in all other creatures. Moreover, this most faithful and prudent lady did nothing to impede these aspirations, but followed them up with all the perfection possible in a creature. Not only did she possess the infused virtue of faith in the promises of our Lord and its concomitant intensity of hope, but over and above all this, she enjoyed beatific vision in which she learnt to know by experience the infinite truth and fidelity of the Most High. And although she did not have occasion to make use of hope while enjoying the vision and possession of the divinity, nevertheless, after again resuming her ordinary state, she was impelled by the memory of what she had enjoyed to hope and strive after it with so much the greater force and avidity Thus the longings of the queen of all virtues constituted a certain kind of new and particular kind of hope. There was another reason why the hope of the Most Holy Mary excelled the hope of all the other faithful joined together, namely the greatness of the prospective reward and glory due to this sovereign queen. For reward is, after all, the real object of hope and in her it was to be far above all the glory of the angels and saints. That is, proportionate to the knowledge of this glory assured to her in God was also her expectation and desire to acquire it. Moreover, in order that she might attain the highest summit of this virtue, and that she might worthily hope for all that the powerful arm of God would work in her, she was befittingly furnished with the light of a supreme faith and all the helps and gifts pertaining thereto and with an especial assistance of the Holy Ghost. What we have said of the virtue of hope in the Blessed Virgin in regard to its principal object must also be affirmed in regard to its secondary objects. For the gifts and mysterious blessings enjoyed by this Queen of Heaven were so great that they could not be amplified even by the arm of the Almighty God in a mere creature. Now, as the great lady was to receive these favors through the medium of faith and hope, these virtues were proportionately great, and therefore the greatest that could possibly fall to the lot of a handiwork of God. Moreover, if as has already been said of the virtue of faith, the Queen of Heaven was endowed with an explicit knowledge and faith of all the revealed truths and of all the mysteries and operations of the Most High. And if the acts of hope corresponded to these acts of faith, who, except the Lord himself, could ever comprehend how many and how excellent were the acts of hope which the Mistress of Virtues elicited since she was aware of her own eternal glory and felicity, and of that which was to be wrought in the rest of the evangelical church by the merits of her most holy Son. For the soul's sake of Mary, as we have before said of her faith, God would have created this virtue, and for her sake he would have conferred it, as he really did, on the whole human race. Number. 491. On this account, the Holy Spirit calls her the mother of beautiful love and holy hope, for just as she became the mother of Christ because she furnished him with the flesh of his body, so the Holy Spirit made her the mother of hope, because by her especial concurrence and cooperation, she conceived and brought forth this virtue for the faithful of the church. Her prerogative of being the mother of holy hope was connected with and consequent upon her being the mother of Jesus Christ our Lord, for she knew that in her son she would lay the foundation of all the security of our hope. On account of these conceptions and births of the most holy queen, she obtained a certain dominion and sovereignty over those graces and the promises of the Most High, 
which depended upon the death of Christ her son for their fulfillment. When she, of her own free will, gave conception and birth to the incarnate word, she turned them all over to us and thereby gave birth to our hope. Thus was accomplished in its legitimate sense that which the Holy Ghost said to her, Thy plants are a paradise. For all that came forth from Mary, the mother of grace, was to constitute our happiness, our paradise, and our certain hope of being able to attain them. The Church has a celestial and true Father in Jesus Christ, for he engendered and founded it by his merits and labors, and enriched it with his graces, his example and his doctrines, as was to be expected from the father and author of such an admirable work. Therefore, it was befitting that the church should have also a loving and kind mother, who, with sweet regalement and caresses, and with maternal solicitude and assistance, should nurse the little children at her breast, nourish them with tender and delicious food as long as they cannot in their infancy bear the food of the robust and strong. This sweet mother was most holy Mary, who, since the beginning of the church, when the law of grace was born in her yet tender children, began to give forth the sweet milk of her enlightened teaching as a merciful mother, and who will continue to the end of the world thus to assist and intercede for the new children which Christ our Lord engenders every day by his merits and at the petitions of this Mother of Mercy. She it is for whom they are born who raises and nourishes them. She is our sweet mother, our life and our hope, the original of the blessings which are ours. She is the example which we are to imitate she is our assurance in the pursuit of the eternal happiness merited by her most holy son she furnishes the assistance necessary for its final attainment instruction of the most holy virgin mary my daughter as with two indefatigable wings my spirit raised its flight by means of faith and hope toward the endless and the highest good, until it rested in union with God through intimate and perfect love. Many times I tasted and enjoyed the clear vision and fruition of him, but as these blessings were not continuous in my state of pilgrimage, I supplied their place by the exercise of faith and hope. They remained with me during my visions and fruitions, and immediately became active during their absence, preventing any cessation in my high aspirations. The effects of these virtues, the love, the efforts, and the desires which they excited in my soul toward the possession of the eternal fruition of God, cannot be adequately comprehended by the created mind in its present limited state. But they shall be known in God, and cause eternal praise in those who will be worthy to see him in heaven. Thou, my dearest, having received such great enlightenment concerning the excellence of this virtue and the works which I practiced by its help, shouldst work without ceasing to imitate me according to the assistance of divine grace. Renew continually and confer within thyself the promise of the Most High, and with unshaken confidence in their divine truthfulness, raise thy heart to ardent desires and longings for their attainment. In this firm hope thou canst assure thyself of arriving through the merits of my Most Holy Son at the blessed cohabitation in the celestial fatherland, and at the companionship of all those who there see in immortal glory the face of the Most High. With its help, 
thou canst raise thy heart above earthly things and fix thy mind upon the immutable good to which thou aspirest. All visible things will appear to thee burdensome and disagreeable, and thou wilt esteem them as vile and contemptible. Nothing wilt thou strive after except that most lovable and delightful object of thy desires. In my soul there was an ardor of hope, such as is possible only to those who have apprehended its object in faith and tasted it by experience. No tongue and no words can describe or express its intensity. Besides, in order to spur thee on still more, consider and deplore with heartfelt sorrow the unhappiness of so many souls who are images of God and capable of his glory and who, through their own fault, are deprived of the true hope of enjoying it. If the children of the Holy Church would pause in their vain occupations and would take time to consider and weigh the blessings of unerring faith and hope which separates them from darkness and which, without their merit, distinguishes them from the followers of blind unbelief, they would without doubt be ashamed of their torpid forgetfulness and repudiate their vile ingratitude. But let them be undeceived, for most terrible punishments await them. They are most detestable in the sight of God and the saints, because they despise the blood shed by Christ for the very purpose of gaining them these blessings. As if all were only a fiction, they treat with contempt the blessings of truth, hastening about during their whole life without spending even one day, and many of them not even an hour, in the consideration of their duties and of their danger. Weep, O soul, over this lamentable evil, and according to thy power, work and pray for its extirpation through my most holy Son. Believe me that whatever exertion and attempt thou makest toward this purpose shall be rewarded by his majesty.